Good morning. Uh, I think we're going to have to start a new ministry here at Family Life. Uh, it's called the Kleenex Ministry. Uh, <laughs> seem to be going through a lot of those last night and this morning. And uh, that's, a, that's awesome. That's awesome because we truly are worshiping not only in music but in prayer. Uh, and I just want to thank the worship team and all those that work back in the sound and all the other volunteers, whether it's youth or children or nursery or, or uh, the hospitality. There are just so many volunteers, we can't name them all, that show up every day, especially on the weekends, and just do an amazing amount of work. So when you get that chance, could you just give a volunteer a hug and tell them thanks? And could you ask them, how can I pray with you? And then let God work on your heart. Where does God want you to be serving? Because he does. We know that. Uh, and he will use you, and he wants to use you. And so uh, just let him have the opportunity to let you serve. I want to welcome all of our visitors. Could we give a big hand for all of our visitors? Thank you for, thank you for being here with us this morning. Uh, and uh, God bless you. <laughs> uh, I'm not Robbie Ashlock. I'm, I'm quite a bit taller than he is. Uh, I can bench press a whole lot more than he can. And he's, uh, he, he had been in Atlanta, but he's here now. Huh? I'm what? You're cuter too. Really? I, I'm, I'm not glad. I don't know if I'm glad you said that. <laughs> But as soon as Robbie walks back in, if it's in the next few minutes, we'll wish him happy birthday because today is his birthday. So, but uh, just welcome. Uh, you know, I'm not very smart uh, because uh, I always am telling God, never. I will never do that, God. God, I would never do that. Well, what I'm doing here this morning is one of those God, I would never do that thing. Uh, and so uh, I've had to experience this in Brazil numerous times, and we laugh about it because everything I ever said I'd never do, I have to do, I get to do in Brazil. I don't have to do it. I now get to do it. Uh, so from now on, I'm going to start telling God, I never want to go to the South Pacific on an <laughs> island resort. I never want to go to the Caribbean on a cruise. I never want to do any of those things. And uh, we'll see if God has a sense of humor which I know he does. You know, uh, the reason I'm up here this, this morning uh, is a part of our, path, or, our, our staff. Uh, there's the birthday boy right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our staff left early Wednesday morning to go to the Orange Conference in Atlanta. Uh, it was easier to get there than it was to come home. Because it's my understanding they started to leave Friday afternoon and Friday evening and flights got canceled. And then they go back out to the airport Saturday morning and there's no plane. And then they finally get home last night around midnight or something. So, And for those of you that travel or haven't traveled, that is some of the most exhausting things you can do. Because uh, you, know, you, you just are out of control. You are completely out of control. And I think it's probably especially difficult for pastors. Because you want to choke somebody, you want to scream and holler, you might want to say some words that you're not supposed to say, and pastors can't do that, you know, so they, their hands were really tied, you know, so they had to just be full of grace. Uh, but we're going to talk about travel a little bit here this morning. Uh, but before I, I go there, I just, uh, I just want to say I'm really glad to see Chelsea here this morning. And the reason I'm glad to see Chelsea here this morning is I just kind of figured, you know, here's our, our staff, and they're in Atlanta, and the flights are delayed, and I know Reagan's going to be cool, and I'm pretty sure Robbie's going to be cool, and I think Brandon's Mr. Peace. But I wasn't worried. I was a little worried about Chelsea. You know, she might have gone crazy on us, and here it, here it is on, you know, the Internet, you know, woman goes crazy in the Atlanta airport. So, Chelsea, I'm really glad to see you here this morning. And she'll get me back for that, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we're going to spend some time talking about 
some of Jesus' travel here this morning. We're going to be in Matthew 15, and we go to the book of Mark 7, and the story is also in there. But Jesus' travel was interrupted, but that wasn't a surprise to Jesus. But it was most definitely a surprise to his disciples. But in all of that, Jesus presented the opportunity for a Canaanite woman to share. And we get to see an amazing witness from a woman. And at the same time, we get to see a very teachable moment that Jesus had to his disciples. So let me go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and and we are... We are just fully blessed, and we are completely thankful for where you have us here today as a church. And God, we lift up Dale Travis and the whole Travis family. God, we are feeling such a such a pain for them. God, we continue to pray healing. And God, we continue to pray for your will. And God, we just thank you for the mighty work that Dale and Linda and the family have done. And God, we just just look forward to, to those days when we can all be together again and healthy. God, I thank you for this family. I just thank you for this time together we have to be in your word. And God, I just thank you for uh, just removing me and letting your Holy Spirit be here. Thank you, Father. And everything we give you the glory and the grace. Amen. So, let me give you just a little background of Matthew 15. There are three main characters. Obviously, Jesus was there. And the Canaanite woman... And we'll learn a lot about her. And then the disciples that were following Jesus. And where the story takes place is an area uh, north of of, uh, where most of the Gentiles, or excuse me, where most of the uh, disciples of Jesus would have been raised. Uh, And it was along the coast of the Mediterranean. And Tyre and Sidon, in their glory days, were amazing uh, shipping points to the Mediterranean. So they were very viable uh, uh, commercial uh, cities. And so they would have been quite vibrant. You know, they would have been a destination for people. Uh, They had a huge influence from the Greek culture. But they were also a region that were idol worshipers. And so the, the Baal... The, the idol Baal was who they worshipped. And so because of all of those dynamics, the Jews looked at that place as a very bad place, as a place not to be, much less to go. And so this, is, this might have been one of the furthest points that Jesus went to in his ministry. But it was also a place where the disciples would have probably been very, very uncomfortable because it would have been a place where they would have typically not gone. It's kind of like what we're called to do. You know, we're called to go to the furthest places. We're called to go to the places where Jesus isn't present, where Jesus is present, but we don't, they don't live Jesus. You know, we're called to go into, into places where Muslims are. We're called to, to go into the darkest places to share the gospel. That's probably how it would have felt to Jesus' disciples. Jesus would have been perfectly comfortable, but the disciples probably were not feeling good about this idea. Uh, But I think what we probably see here is that Jesus was taking his disciples on a little field trip. He was getting them out of their region, out of that Jewish culture, and getting them really out of their comfort zone. But what we see also, even though this was a region that was full of idolatry in the past and had been, been very evil, if we go to Mark, 7, uh, Mark 3, we get to see that these people 
were seekers. There were some of them that were seeking Jesus. So when we go to Mark 3, 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, and Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan around Tyre and Sidon. So they were leaving there and seeking Jesus. So there were believers there. There were followers there. There were people who wanted to know more about Jesus. Some commentaries state that Jesus went here to rest. And if he went here to rest, he was interrupted by a Canaanite woman. So let me read Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now there's eight short verses. And the first time you read it, the first time you look at it, it's just confusing. You know, we just see so many things going on in here that really don't make sense to us that how we'd like to see Jesus acting, how we'd like to see the story being told, you know, the dogs, the crumbs. So what we're going to do here for a few minutes is we're just going to kind of peel back in this. And I think as we peel back, uh, we'll see a, a really interesting personality of Jesus and of disciples, and we'll see a Canaanite woman who is truly, 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 truly pursuing Jesus. You know, it says in verse 23, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out. You know, when we think of crying out, we think somebody's just making a little noise, you know, hey, Jesus, over here. But as we'll see, she does this twice. And so the region they were in, the disciples would have been so-called in enemy territory. So this woman is crying out, making a big scene. And I'm sure the disciples are going, be quiet, you know. We're kind of a little uncomfortable here already. You're making a lot of noise. You're going to draw a... a, a, a a big crowd here. Something might be going on and we're going we're gonna to look bad here. So the disciples, it appears, as we see, were probably not very comfortable at all with this. But she's crying out. And immediately she says, Lord, Son of David. Well, that tells me that this woman knew Jesus because she called him Lord, Son of David. So she would have known that the Messiah came from the lineage of David. So she knew who he was. She knew he was Jesus, the Savior. So she was addressing him very properly. But the first thing she does is, we already know as we read, that the reasons all of this is happening, happening is because of her daughter being demon-possessed. But the first thing she asks as she comes to Jesus is, have mercy on me. 
She's looking at that relationship between her and Jesus. And she's wanting to come with a clean spirit. Forgive me, Jesus. And we don't even know what she's, what she's coming, asking mercy for. But she's coming to him asking for mercy. Very first thing. My daughter is suffering. Now we hear why she's coming. My daughter is suffering, suffering terribly from demon possession. Now, as a man, when my children hurt, I hurt. But I don't think there's any comparison to when your children hurt as a woman. I mean, I've seen my wife, Kayla, when, when our kids are sick or hurting, she's just as sick and just as hurting as they are. And, you know, I'd go off to work and hope they're okay when I get home and, you know, she took care of it. But I think when this woman comes and she's talking about her demon-possessed, terribly demon-possessed daughter, it's just multiplied over. So I cannot imagine what pain and misery she's in and why she is crying out. And then we go to verse 23 and we see something that we don't see very often. And Robbie mentioned it the other day in a sermon about that, uh, that uncomfortable silence. Jesus did not answer a word. So here you come, you know who Jesus is, you run to him, have mercy on me, here's my dilemma, and you hear nothing. There's no response. And the way it's read, not a word. So it's like, maybe not even any body language. Not a huh? Nothing. And I know how I'd feel if I'd ran up to Jesus and wanted to dress him and ask him or talk to him and I got a nothing. You know, it's like you shut down. But we'll see that this woman was not shut down. But the disciples took a window here and it was a little small window, but they jumped right in there. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. So I think we can see that the disciples do not like this situation at all. And they're looking at this saying, we got a chance here. My Jesus is working for us. We're uncomfortable. Jesus isn't even speaking to her. Way to go. Ignoring her, Jesus. Way to go. But we don't know what they're really asking. Are they asking Jesus to heal the daughter so she'll go away? Or are they wanting Jesus to just tell her to go away? But I sense the disciples are saying, you know, Jesus, way to go. Quiet her down, make her go away. Either way, cured or uncured. And then Jesus comes right back in this next verse. Sometimes I think we read it and we might think he was talking to the Canaanite woman. No, he's talking to his disciples. And he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. You know, when we first see that, we go, wow, where did that come in? Is that a misplaced verse in there? What does that mean? But when we understand Jesus as a Jew... He came as a Jew and his mission, his initial mission was to reach the Jewish people to become followers of Jesus. So he was, he came to, to seek the lost sheep of Israel. That was his initial mission. And so when he said that, Speaking to the disciples, they probably once again said, way to go, Jesus. We like what you're saying because you're reinforcing us as the disciples. We're in an uncomfortable place. This lady's making a scene, and you're on our side. So this is going to turn out okay. But then the woman shows up again. And we don't know what, you know, was this a minute or two or five or an hour or maybe even days. We don't know the time span here. But then we see the woman came back again. And this time she came differently. Some versions say that she bowed down. Other versions say she knelt down. But she came presenting herself, worshiping him, 
adoring him for who he was, Jesus. She was honoring him. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. So the first time she came and she said, have mercy. The second time she comes back, and again, remember, Jesus hasn't spoken to her yet. She's still coming back. And she says, help me. And then he replied. The second time Jesus replied. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. And again, we get another verse and we kind of go, now where did that one come from? But when we understand the, the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles, you know, the Jewish people sometimes call the Gentiles dog. It was a very negative term, but they would call them dogs. So Jesus said, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. It's not right to take it from those that it's intended for and give it to somebody who it's not intended for. Now, I don't know about your house, but around our house when our kids were younger, you know, we always liked having a dog around because it was kind of how we mopped the floor. So. But at this, in this time, you know, the dog would have been something that would have got just what happened to fall off. You know, it wasn't, it would have been meager. It would have been crumbs. It would have been almost insignificant. But then between verses 26 and 27, something happens. And I think it is exactly what God allows to happen in all of us. And I think we so often miss the opportunity. But it's a chance to communicate with God. It's a chance to talk to Jesus. You know, we're not punished for talking to Jesus. But I think so often we think, I can't, I can't go to Jesus with that. I can't talk to him about that. I can't pray with him about that. He's Jesus. I'm not. You know, I, I'm not worthy. But the Canaanite woman tells us, yes, we can talk with our master. She comes to him and she says, yes, Lord. And she's acknowledging I might be a dog. I know I'm a Gentile. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not worthy of you. So she's submitting. We don't see the word submission or submit, but she is submitting to Jesus right here. So she came to him and she asked for mercy. She asked for help. And now she comes and submits completely to him. You know, all of us who know Jesus Christ have done what the Canaanite woman has done. And there may be some in here today who don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And maybe the Holy Spirit is tugging on you today. He's talking to you. There's something going on. You hadn't intended to be here. You hadn't intended to to, to be thinking about church today. You hadn't really wanted to think about God today. But maybe the Holy Spirit is tugging on you. Because those of us that know Jesus have gone through the same steps that the Canaanite woman did. We sought mercy. We asked for help. And we surrendered. And until we do that, we can't be filled with Jesus. Jesus. And so, if any of you are being tugged by the Holy Spirit today, I'd love to visit with you after this service. I could be over here, reach out to Robbie or any of the staff, any of the elders. We'd love to share Jesus with you. But the lady answers, But even the dogs eat the crumbs 
that fall from the master's table. So she is. She's completely submitting to him. She is just saying, whatever. I am yours. Completely. And then Jesus answers her. Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. You know, so often I go to, I go in prayer seeking something and I just want the answer. I don't want to go through the, through the trial, through the pain. I just want an answer and I want it to be my answer. You know, this Canaanite woman came and she made it real clear to Jesus why she was there up front. But she never gave, gave up. She kept coming back to him. But she completely turned herself to him. Whatever he said, I'm convinced she was going to do. If Jesus had said, I'm sorry, I am not going to cure your daughter, I believe that Canaanite woman would have hugged Jesus just as much because she had sought him through mercy. She asked for his help and she submitted. And when we submit... We submit to whatever God tells us. Not what we want Him to tell us, but to whatever God tells us. It's not our choice. That's called submission. Now, I think oftentimes we might see this story as a story of Jesus being almost heartless by not speaking a word. You know, there's been so many times I have been more blessed by Jesus not answering me than he has by answering me. Because some of the stuff I've asked Jesus for has, been, has turned out to be so wrong and so incorrect and so selfish and so prideful because it was what I was wanting. And I wasn't thinking of what his eternal plan was. Not only for me, but his eternal plan for those that I have contact with or influence with. I was being selfish. So I'm, I'm very thankful sometimes when God does not talk to me. Because he is talking to me then. And he's telling me, no, not what you want, not in your timing, not in your way, but in my way in my time, in my place, when you're ready. Because most of the time, I'm not ready for what I'm asking for. You know, Jesus could have said no. He could have said not now. He could have said I'm resting. You know, I'm on, I'm on holiday here. He could have said no. But he didn't. Jesus allows us to pursue him. He wants us to pursue him. This wasn't coincidental that the Canaanite woman and Jesus connected. He wants us to be just like the Canaanite woman, chasing after Jesus. And not just when we want something, but constantly and nonstop, chasing after Jesus, pursuing him. Jesus also wants to use us as a conduit for him to pursue others. That's the opportunity we have as believers to show Jesus in our workplace, in the grocery store, in the far corners of the world, in our neighborhoods. He wants to use us to pursue others. And then when we live in faith, as the Canaanite woman lived in faith, we keep nothing from God. We don't have any maybes or buts or not now or whys. When we truly walk in faith, with Jesus Christ. 
we hold nothing back. And that's really, really hard. Because there's another person out there, there's another situation out there, it's called evil. It's called the devil. And it wants us to hang on to just a little bit. Because as soon as we hold on to just a little bit, that's what can keep us from having that complete faith in God. The devil doesn't want all of us. He just wants enough to keep us from being completely sold out for Jesus Christ. So as we wrap up, just four points I'd like to make. How's my faith? You know, and I think this is something that I... I should really think about every day. Maybe the first thing when I get up every morning. How's my faith? Maybe the last thing I do at night. How's my faith? You know, I'm never alone. Doesn't re it's regar regardless of what people may say, what I may think, what others may tell me, what the situation may be, I'm never alone. Jesus is always right there with me. Hopefully I'm a little behind him, not trying to be in front of him. But we're never alone, so we don't have to worry. We must be in constant pursuit of Jesus. And as soon as we're not in constant pursuit, we leave that little window of opportunity open for, death, for the evil one to show up. And he will show up. God pursues us through others. Or God pursues others through us. Allow him to do that. And this is the uncomfortable part. This is where we have to really get out of our comfort zone, where we have to say, you want me to do what, God? You want me to get up on the stage and give a message? God, are you sure? God wants us to be uncomfortable. But we're never alone, so we don't have to worry about that. And we live in faith. We keep nothing just nothing. So my prayer as we close here is that we think about those things that are keeping us from being completely and totally faithful to what God has already prepared for us and wants us to be and do. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for your message. I thank you for your holy word. And I thank you that in everything we do, we are complete failures. Anything we think we can do will not be glorifying to you, will not serve you. God, first of all, we just need to cleanse ourselves of absolutely everything so that we come to you first and foremost acknowledging you, God, are our King and Master, our Creator, our Sovereign Lord, and that through you and because of you, we have a purpose. And that, God, as we come to you and we seek your will and your way and your timing, God, you will, just, you will just complete us. And you will take us out of our comfort. And you will take us on travels that we don't like. On roads that have detours. And you will take us down paths where we don't hear from you. And we wonder, where are you? But you will find us, you will tell us, and you will show us. God, I just pray for us to be faithful to you in everything that we do. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who went to the cross for me. Because I am a sinner, and I thank you. Amen.